Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. If I told you there was a time when architects were so disgusted with modern architecture and modern values that they purposely went back into history and copied those styles in order to make a statement about culture, you might think I was talking about the current neoclassical movement which designs in the face of Bauhaus modernism. But actually, I'm talking about Russia in the 19th century. The Church of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ in St. Petersburg resurrected Russian medieval architecture, which was replaced by that modern Baroque architecture, a Greco-Roman inspired style. It is also known as the Church of the Spilled Blood, but we will get into why later. Like many Architecture Codex videos, this will do a little backstory before we get into the actual building. And because this is Russian history, it will be long and it will be sad. Peter the Great became the sole Tsar of Russia at the age of 22. Prior, when he was just 10 years old, he had to share power, but he could not exercise it. During 12 years of struggle, he had to banish a half-sister, wait for a sickly, childless older brother to die, and rival his dominating mother. However, it had been presumed that he was never going to be Tsar, so he was actually freer than his older brother and got a more liberal, more Western European education than most Tsars would get. When Peter became Tsar, he saw an opportunity to change Russia from a backward, feudal, agrarian serf nation to a modern European state. Culturally, Russia and the Byzantine Empire were gradually separated from the West over a thousand year period, but they had the same Roman roots. In fact, the word for their ruler, Tsar, like Caesar, was derived from the Roman word Caesar. Peter visited Europe numerous times. Europe was well into the Baroque and Rococo phase of architecture. Both names were derisive ones given to this era centuries later. I favor Baroque over Rococo. Rococo is just too much decoration. But Baroque's appeal is that it added dynamic movement to quiet, stable, neoclassical Renaissance buildings rendered by the likes of Andrea Palladio. You can see it in the works of Bernini and Borromini. There's much more captured energy. Peter was so entranced by this modern architecture, which is what they called it at the time, that he thought it would be good to bring this art and architecture and the modern inventions of Europe to his backward little country of Russia. Peter also had other goals, and while he was a reformer, he was still a despot. So he used many of the methods available to him at the time in a form of governance that might later be called real politics. For example, to make Russian men look more modern, more European, he wanted them clean shaven. And to this end, he taxed facial hair unless you were a serf or a cleric. And there were other methods too, but some of them involved more violence. One of his goals was a year-round port as waters in the North Baltic were frozen and therefore isolated Russia for much of the year. He felt this isolation contributed to Russia's backwardness and limited economic growth. In the South, he conquered territory to establish port cities on the Caspian and Black Seas and even started a canal to connect the two. But a route to the Mediterranean Sea and the world was still blocked by Muslim Istanbul, not Constantinople who would stop or tax ships from that Christian Russian Orthodox country. And he could not generate interest in Europe to take the city of Istanbul back into Christendom. In 1703, on the north, he conquered enough territory from Sweden, who then controlled the region around the Bay of Finland, and established St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg would be the new capital of Russia, with access to the Baltic Sea. It would give Peter a port city that could connect Russia with the rest of Europe, at least during the warm months of the year. Building the city was not easy, and Peter had to force workers and nobles to come to the city. Many tens of thousands died for different reasons. His vision was a modern Baroque city with canals to be a northern version of Venice. 
For this, he imported artisans and architects from Europe. Through his work and the work of his successors, they acquired a lot of Greco-Roman art and built a beautiful city with those canals and impressive Baroque and Rococo buildings. This gets back to the core struggle of Northern European against Mediterranean Europe. That presumption that even Germanic, Frankish, and Celtic cultures had that Greco-Roman culture was sophisticated, erudite, and the culture of civilization. There are a lot of great Greco-Roman buildings to see in St. Petersburg proper and the environs. And here are just some. The Smolny Cathedral, built by Italian architect Bartolomeo Rastrelli between 1748 and 1764, was part of a monastery where Peter's daughter Elizabeth either hid or to which she was banished when she was not allowed to ascend to the throne. Later, a coup restored her to power and she left the monastery. The church shows a combination of Italian Baroque detailing around a neoclassical dome with surrounding towers that morph into Russian onion domes. Note to self, when one goes about sketching in St. Petersburg in December, the sun is only up from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And you better carry extra pens inside your pocket to keep them warm because the pen with which you are sketching will freeze. The Winter Palace of the Tsars was begun during Peter the Great's reign, but what we see today is a result of a major change and upgrade in the early 19th century. Originally, the architects were primarily Jorge Matarovnovi and Domenico Trezzini, but these projects are so large and so detailed that it was common for many dozens of architects to be given parts to design, particularly certain interior rooms. This home to the Tsars is about 650,000 square feet in size. As the palace had a public function, there were private rooms dedicated to the family where they could hide and, in essence, be hermits. Hence, the nickname for the building became the Hermitage. In 1850, in what is perhaps the greatest yard sale of all time, the Tsars acquired the entire art collection of the Republic of Venice. And this collection included a lot of great copies of Roman and Renaissance statues. This helped bring even more Greco-Roman culture and prestige to Russia, but only for the royals and the nobles, those privileged enough to be invited into the Winter Palace. In 1905, a peaceful protest for reform led by Father Jorge Gapon ended when the people entered the square just outside the Winter Palace, a square very much like Bernini's Piazza San Pietro and a soldier opened fire and a massacre occurred that is known today as Bloody Sunday. Twelve years later, in 1917, the Tsars have been deposed and in October, the provisional government housed in the Winter Palace are stormed by the Big Party, or in Russian, the Bolsheviks, which signals the communist takeover of the Russian government. Like the Louvre in Paris during the French Revolution of 1789, the Winter Palace in spite of some initial pillage and destruction, is eventually opened as a museum for the people during the communist Soviet period. St. Isaac's Cathedral was built in the early 19th century by French architect Auguste de Montferrand. It boasts solid red granite columns on all four facades, and it is self-evident how this church was influenced by the Pantheon and Villa Capra by Palladio, perhaps the perfect Renaissance building but the window pediments, cartouches, and other details are more Baroque than Renaissance. The dome is one of the largest in the world. The cathedral was severely damaged during the siege of the city in World War II, but has been mostly restored. And after serving as a museum during the Soviet era, the building is once again a functioning church since 2017. The Peterhof Palace, also known as the Summer Palace, was begun during the time of Peter the Great by architect Domenico Trezzini. The style is known as Petrine Baroque, which basically means Baroque done for Peter. It innovated on Italian Baroque by adding more intense color and a lot more gilded gold. This makes it distinct from what you would see in Rome or France. The fountains and the gardens of the Peterhof rival Villa d'Este and Versailles in their elaborate use of water and art. In 1941, Hitler's army lays siege to St. Petersburg, 
then known as Leningrad. And for the three years of the siege, they never got into the city proper, despite the constant shelling. They did, however, occupy the Peterhof and stripped it of all its gold and art treasures. In addition to the loss of art, the German siege killed 650,000 of the 3 million people who lived in Leningrad. Another 1.7 million fled the city. Russia restored much of the city after World War II, but the restoration of the Peterhof was not started until after the Soviet Union fell. It is poignant that at the time of my visit, in 1992, the Germans were back, providing capital for all sorts of real estate development in and around St. Petersburg. The desire to be Western was not universal in Russia, and we have seen that Russian history is complex before, during, and since the Soviet period. This separation is made greater by the fact that we use a completely different alphabet. For example, what we call the USSR, when we see the letters, appears to us as CCCP, but it's actually the Russian letters for SSSR, which stands for the Soyuz Sovietsky Socialistsky Republic, which means the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic. I apologize again for my foreign language skills. My Russian is no better than my French, even though I studied Russian in high school when I thought I might be an aerospace engineer. But these days, all I can do is sort of sound out the Cyrillic alphabet and maybe work in the phrase Ya prepojitayl to pisat na sabakya, which, depending upon my accent, could mean I prefer to write on the dog or I prefer to urinate on the dog. Either way, it's hard to work that into a conversation. Back to the building. The Church of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ started in 1883 and was built on the site of the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, which is why it is also known as the Church of the Spilled Blood. Remember, this is Russian history. There were six previous attempts on the life of Alexander II, but on March 1st in 1881, while returning to the Winter Palace, a terrorist from the group The People's Will threw a bomb underneath his carriage. When he got out of the carriage unhurt, a second terrorist threw another bomb which exploded at his feet. He died an hour later at the Winter Palace. Alexander II was a reformer, having freed the serfs in 1861, but when he was challenged, he would revert back to authoritarianism. That very morning, he had established a legislative body for the people, but the reforms were not coming fast enough for some of the people. His successor, Tsar Alexander III, commissioned the church on the spot along the now Griboyedov Canal in his father's memory. Alexander III dissolved the legislative body and wanted to establish the absolute power of the Russian monarchy as he believed the reforms led to his father's assassination. Give the people an inch. To this end, the church, as designed by German-Scottish architect Alfred Parland, purposely rejected the Baroque style, the modern style that was dominant in St. Petersburg and resembles St. Basil's in Moscow. Alexander III was reminding the people that he was as powerful as Ivan the Terrible, who had started St. Basil's in the 16th century, and his powers were supreme and ancient. St. Basil's, and consequently the Resurrection Church, are distinctly and iconically Russian. The multiple onion domes are very much part of the Eastern Orthodox churches from Russia to Jerusalem. The dynamic use of various bright colors do not seem garish when seen against a gray Russian winter sky. The building uses stone, enamel ceramics, enameled wood, and gold gilding. The result is intense, dazzling, overwhelming, and powerful. And this is a style of building unseen anywhere else. The inside is no less impressive, with 70,000 square feet of mosaics and traditional Russian Orthodox icons. The onion domes at both St. Basil's and the Church of the Resurrection are descendants of the wood domes on smaller rural churches throughout Russia and the Eastern Orthodox regions. They are all descendants of Byzantine churches, which tended towards centrally planned buildings with a dome. Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, when it was Constantinople, perhaps started this trend. 
That morphed into the helmet domes, such as what soldiers might wear, as Russian architects sought to make the dome more flame-like, literally flamboyant. There might have been some practical reasons too, as this form sheds water and snow better than domes that terminate at the drum. And there are records of these domes existing as early as the 13th century. The Church of the Resurrection was saved from destruction by the communists, owing primarily to their incompetence. During World War II, they used it as a morgue during the siege of Leningrad. And after World War II, they still planned to demolish it, but the people actually stood up and stopped it. Regardless of the ideology or the reason for it being built, the beauty of the architecture spoke to the people. They saved it, and the building was eventually restored. This is the part of Architecture Codex where I usually sum up the video with some sort of amusing or sardonic joke, or perhaps go for something more profound. Usually. But Russian history is so depressing, I'm just going to stop. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex. Thank you.